Morals and Man, Part 1 Preface Man is all symmetry, said George Herbert. The statement, true enough, still in the context he gave it, would hardly suggest itself as a general description of man in the world of today. The modern poet leaves perfection to his betters and asks less for human nature. God, thou great symmetry, who put abiding lust in me, from whence my sorrows spring, for all the frittered days that I have spent in shapeless ways, give me one perfect thing. One perfect thing salvaged from the confusion and shapelessness of our life, our world. It is what we are all asking, and what contemporary national and international affairs and personal problems laugh at us for asking. We can make symmetry in stones if we cannot always see sermons. We cannot make symmetry of our world in ourselves. Experience has helped us little, and indeed, as Bacon remarked, experience is of scant use in these matters without reason and judgment. Expert men can execute and perhaps judge of particulars one by one, but the general counsels and the plots and marshalling of affairs come best from those that are learned. If the present study attempts to discuss modern problems in the light of ancient as well as modern wisdom, it is because the problem of today are in essential still the problems of other ages, and because wisdom is ageless. What is here aimed at is the presentation of a point of view, attempting to argue indeed, but not to bludgeon, a statement, not an apologetic. Baron von Hugel, hailed in one issue of the Times as the greatest apologist of the Roman Church, remarked in the next that, having hoped to do well in the dog class, he was disconcerted to find himself given first prize among cats. A Dominican may perhaps be permitted to make the sentiment his own. To try to exclude theology altogether from the view here put forward would have been to parody it. But the emphasis in the first part of the book, and in some of the latter chapters, have been on philosophy. The appeal has been to reason, and if this has meant that the presentation of many points fails to give a full statement of Christian teaching, on the other hand it has allowed of keeping the discussion on the group on the ground common to all reasonable mortal beasts. The first part of the book is an elaboration of papers read to the Aquinas Societies of London and Leicester. Some of the latter chapters have appeared, in substance, in Blackfriars, Colosseum, The Month, Reconciliation. I wish to thank the editors of these reviews for their kindness in permitting me to reprint the articles here. I also wish to express my deep gratitude to the friends whose patient help and encouragement enabled me to remove so many faults from the book and to publish it. Gerald Van, Laxton, 22nd of November, 1937. Part 1. The Theory. Chapter 1. The Need of a Theory. Greenhorns, said Roger Bacon, adore universals. The plain man views with suspicion the absorption in the abstract, the contempt of the particular and fleeting, which are so often characteristic of the philosopher. He is apt to regard the thinker as just a polytechnician, as Moroy put it, a man who believes that all beings, animate or inanimate, can be rigorously defined and subjected to algebraic calculation. Immediate awareness of the world, he feels, is sacrificed to the unreality of academic reasoning. That false secondary power by which we multiply distinctions, 
than deem that our puny boundaries are things that we perceive and not what we have made. But not all philosophers are spiders. And on the other hand, the finding of unity, the establishment of order, our concern of thought. We do not want to be like the girl in the crock of gold who thought in kinks and spoke in spasms. It is well to have the ordered thought before the action, the look before we leap. The the feeling today is that we have little or no idea where we are leaping. What we are aiming at, or ought to be aiming at, the good old days are gone, the days of majestic prosperity, of jaunty jingoism, of moral self-complacency. Nobody today could seriously cry, God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. Confused and tormented by cataclysmic events in contemporary history, writes Dr. Reinhold Niebuhr, the modern mind faces the disintegration of its civilization in alternate moods of fear and hope, of faith and despair. The culture of modernity was the artifact of modern civilization, product of its unique and characteristic conditions, and it therefore not surprising that its minarets of the spirit should fall when the material foundations of its civilization begin to crumble. Its optimism has no more solid foundation than the expansive mood of triumphant capitalism and naturally gives way to confusion and despair when the material conditions of life are seriously altered. Therefore the lights in its towers are extinguished at the very moment when light is needed to survey the havoc wrought in the city and the plan of rebuilding. All is certainly not right with the world. But it is not easy to say precisely what is wrong with the world. We can talk about economic and political crises, or about the tragedy of decaying culture, of a social morality forgotten or derided, the dwindling of churches, the decay of religion. But these things are perhaps the diverse effects of a single organic disease. Where is the germ? And supposing that we can rightly diagnose the disease, what are we individually to do about it? Voltaire made his hero Candide decide to give up philosophy and great ambitions and cultivate his back garden. George Bernard Shaw and his little black girl did the same. Are we to agree with them? To leave cosmic crises to look after themselves? To retreat from Armageddon in good time? What indeed can I as an individual do about revolutions and crises? But this line of argument is open to serious objections. We cannot, even if we wish, live in complete isolation. Our own back garden abuts on those of too many other people. We are all to some degree children of our age. We have inherited a set of ideas, taboos, tastes, beliefs, an outlook, a code of conventions. We may possess enough independence of character to rise above this lowest common multiple. We cannot wholly rid ourselves of it. We are incorporated in family, friendships, religion, country. We are all passengers on some sort of ship, and we sink or sail with it. And even if we could find a completely secluded garden in which to grow our cabbages, their size and shape and species, and the order of their growing, and the destination of their maturity, would have to be decided. We should at least have to plan out our own lives to form our own philosophy. I may argue that I simply earn my living, I make friendships, I marry and bring up my children, and for all this I need nothing more elaborate than the ordinary ideas and rules current about me. I don't swindle people, I tell the truth. I am a respectable citizen. But already there are, in fact, complications. How do I know that these ideas are sound ideas? 
or, at any rate, the best ideas. How do I know that they are sufficient equipment for all possible needs? It is, in any case, dignified to accept them without scrutiny, without making them part of myself by arguing to them in my own mind. It is, in fact, characteristic of our world that it tends to accept its ideas ready-made. Press, cinema, wireless, television, all the ordinary channels of information tend to become instead instruments of coercion. We are almost in the position of the children in Brave New World, having opinions pumped into them as they sleep. Censorship or commercial and other interests try to some extent to regulate what we shall read or see and what not. Conventions and laws to regulate what we shall do and what and what not. And we cannot but recognize that there is a danger here in subhumanity, just as we cannot but recognize that with so much to occupy the surface of the mind and imagination, so much work and so much play, it is possible to pass one's whole life without really thinking at all, without bothering about the major problems of life without asking what it's all about and where is it leading. Suppose, then, a man upon whom the horror of his previous lack of independent thought has suddenly dawned. I will start, he says, by finding what things really are. What is the world? What is man? What is the soul? What are art, literature, beauty? And what are wealth and happiness and love? He asks for a definition of man. Biologist, psychologist, moralist, politician, economist, eugenicist, preacher, all have different ideas. The bewildered inquirer stops to sort things out. That is indeed the present need. There is more information, more knowledge of fact, available today than ever before. But this means that it is more than ever necessary to sort things out. The chaos of society comes of the chaos of unsorted knowledge. But how reduce a mass of facts to order? The inquirer will have to go on to ask the end or purpose of the things whose natures he has been studying. And again, he will receive many different answers. But man cannot simultaneously have numberless different ends. He must have some ultimate purpose which includes them all. Order means unity, and a multiplicity of things is reduced to order by being reduced in some way to one. Philosophy is the view of things as a whole, their what and why and whither. Even if we are to leave the world, to look after itself, still we must discover the what and why and whither of ourselves if we are to make any success of the business of living. There would be less difficulty, though less excitement, if we were like other beings directed by iron physical laws. If one could discover the nature of man and his inevitable reactions to stimuli as a botanist does of plants or a chemist of chemicals, if a man just grew into a definite invariable completion as an acorn grows into an oak, there would be fewer problems. But it is not usually thought to be so simple. Most people at least hold that man has free will and he can choose for himself what ends to pursue, to some degree at least, and hence human beings do not work out according to pattern. They bring about all sorts of disasters and flounder and all sorts of theories about themselves and everything else. Physical necessity becomes moral obligation or duty and a whole new series of problems arise. But why, again, all this bother about philosophizing over so simple a matter? A man must try to make a career for himself and find happiness. Why not let him get on with it? Is not the philosopher just making difficulties? No, we spend our time pursuing what we think to be happiness, only to find, often enough, when we get there, that it is not happiness at all. 
We devote our energies to achieving success in a career, only to find that it is the wrong career. We had not investigated the what and and the why. Again, we may admit that there is such a thing as moral obligation. We may even permit ourselves to talk about sin and evil. But we say that our English code of morals, the maxims we learn as children, are sufficient. There is no need to think things out any further. And then something occurs to which none of these handy maxims seem to apply. And we are at a loss. We are bound then to think things out, not each particular case of each particular type as it occurs, but the general types of cases, the scheme of life as a whole that we are trying to actively to bring about. We have to think out an order, a synthesized scheme of the principles of living. In an earlier age, it was held that economics, the science of wealth and how it is acquired, was a physical science, that things like labor, wages, price, worked according to strict and immutable laws, that the amount a man receives for his day's work, for example, was as rigidly the result of a set of existing circumstances as water is the result of combining hydrogen and oxygen. This was a convenient doctrine for the people who were getting rich quick, since it forbade them to do anything about those who were becoming increasingly poorer. There is, of course, truth in the theory. The law of supply and demand does determine price, but it is not the whole truth. One can interfere with economic laws, and there is no such thing as the economic man invented by the theorist the man wholly governed by their immutable laws. It was held, for example, that the population was regulated mechanically by supply and demand for labor. Overpopulation was impossible. This theory was attacked by Malthus as early as 1798, and today it is not considered, but it provides a text from which to move on to a further point. Economic considerations today have much to say about the size of families, but once grant that ethics, the science of what is morally right, refuses to sanction the course of action proposed by economics, and what is a man to do? Which science is he to obey? One set of principles must be higher, have more authority than the other. Which is it? We can decide only by being a philosopher, by looking at the problem as a whole, and so deciding that, while man is both an economic animal and a moral animal, the latter aspect is the more important, that he may not seek economic well-being at the expense of moral goodness. Similar problems arise in the sphere of politics. The morality as opposed to the political utility of war, empire, taxations, the tactic of parties, the danger of putting the political cart before the ethical horse. A man, then, who wants to be really human and not a machine or a child, has to find himself philosophical principles which may offer him criteria in every department of life. Is philosophy enough? For the Christian, the answer must be no. He can rightly say that his main questions of what and whither are already answered for him. These things, then, he might argue, he accepts. He needs not bother his head any further about them. He worships God and church every Sunday. Let him get on with his job on Monday. Such an attitude, however, would represent a fundamental misconception the divorce of religion from life. It is not enough to accept a number of truths about God. We have to apply them, to live them. We have not merely to say, I believe that God became man, but to ask what bearing this fact has on human existence. Religion cannot be merely something one does on Sundays. It must comprise the whole of life, the directing of all one's life to God, and thus every action is either religious or irreligious, nothing is merely non-religious. 
The business of synthesis or ordering the subordination of one science to another, the sacred science, still remains to be done. Theology is thus essential. A man cannot merely, by accepting the Christian dogmas, proceed forthwith to put them into practice. He cannot be expected to see at once their bearing upon the conduct of human life. What is the implication, for example, of the doctrines of the Trinity or the Incarnation for human behavior? The fact that so many diverse answers have been given is proof enough that the answer is not immediately obvious. The broad moral principles, again, are given, but the application of these to varying incidents of daily life is a thing which has to be thought out. And the dependence of the moral principles and the doctrinal truths have to be elicited if life is to be unified. All this is theology. And in this sense, every man must be a theologian. The business of particularization and of synthesis is not a luxury for leisure hours. It is a vital necessity. For to preach Christ without bothering about the pattern of Christ-like on earth is to beat the air with wings. It is to state the premises of many problems without attempting to suggest the way in which the problems are to be faced. It is precisely on the grounds of its remoteness from the actual problems of life that religion is so often criticized today. The churches, so the critics hold, have been left high and dry. They are incapable now of helping man in his search for an answer to his problems. Religion stands at the crossroads, writes Professor McMurray. Throughout the world the parties of social progress are, in general, either passively or actively anti-religious. Organized religion, on the defensive, tends to range itself, actively or passively, with the conservatives and the reactionaries. But the tide of social evolution cannot be forever be damned by the dikes of vested interest. The progressive forces are bound to win, and it looks as though the bursting of the dikes would be quick and catastrophic. If, in that hour, religion is still found on the side of reaction, as it was in Russia, it must suffer almost total eclipse. Its existing forms will be doomed to destruction. It is not only those outside the church who have deplored the least, at least, apparent alliance of religion with vested interest. The author of Peace in the Clergy writes, the proletariat feel their existence threatened by the sacrifices which capitalism and militarism impose upon them, and what embitters them more than anything is the idea that they have that the church is in league with these powers. But the criticism goes deeper than any question on the behavior of Christians. A socially imperiled generation, writes Dr. Niebuhr, will have both the inclination and the right to dismiss profound and ultimate interpretations of life, which are not made relevant <clears throat> to the immediate problems of social justice. Men whose very existence is imparalleled by those by whose universe of meaning is reduced to chaos by the social maladjustments of a technical society may be pardoned if they dismiss as a luxury which they cannot afford, any profound religion which does not concern itself with these problems. Of liberal Christianity, he writes, its energy for some decades have been devoted to the task of proving religion and science compatible, a purpose which has sought to fulfill by disavowing the more incredible portion of its religious heritage and clothing the remainder in terms acceptable to the modern mind. It has now discovered, rather belatedly, that this same modern mind, which only yesterday seemed to be the final arbiter of truth, beauty, and goodness, is in a sad state of confusion today, amid the debris of the shattered temple of its dreams and hopes, in adjusting itself to the characteristic credos and prejudices of mod modernity, the 
liberal church has been in constant danger of obscuring what distinctive in the Christian message and creative in Christian morality. Sometimes it fell to the level of merely clothing the naturalistic philosophy and the utilitarian ethics of modernity with pious phrases. Modern culture is compounded of the genuine achievements of science and the peculiar ethos of a commercial civilization. The superficialities of the latter, with its complacent optimism, its loss of the sense of depth and the knowledge of good and evil, the heights of good and the depths of evil, were at least as influential in it, if not more influential, than the discoveries of science. Therefore, the adjustment of modern religion to the mind of modern culture inevitably involved cap capitulation to its thin soul. The Christian ideal of love became a council of prudential net mutuality so dear in necessity to a complex commercial civilization. The Christ of Christian orthodoxy became the good man of Galilee, a symbol of human goodness and human possibilities without suggestion of the limits of the human and the temporal. In short, without the suggestion of trans transcendence. Failure to retain the sense of the depths of evil means an unwarranted optimism, and liberal Christianity thus assumed that the law of love needed only to be stated persuasively to overcome the selfishness of the human heart. The unhappy consequence of that optimism was to discourage interest in the necessary mechanisms of social justice at the precise moment in history when the development of a technical civilization require more than ever the social ideals be implemented with economic and political techniques. The purely moralistic approach of the modern church to politics is really a religio-moral version of laissez-faire economics. Orthodox Christianity, according to the same writer, arrives at the same end by a different road. Three factors brought about this result. First, sacramentalism, in which the natural world, including, unfortunately, the social orders of human history, is celebrated as the handiwork of God, and every natural fact is rightly seen as an image of the transcendent, but wrongly covered so completely with the aria of sanctity so as to obscure its imperfections. Secondly, pessimism had a similar influence. The fact of the sinfulness of the world was used as an excuse for the complacent acceptance of whatever imperfect justice is given social order had established. And finally, a cosmism reaction to naturalism drives Christianity into otherworldly dualism in which the transcendent ceases to have relevance to the historical and temporal process. We should be ill-advised if we light-heartedly dismissed criticisms such as these as baseless and unwarranted, but the point for the moment is simply their relevance in showing that, certain Christian facts accepted, all discussion is not at an end. We have always to examine for ourselves the relevance of the facts to the problems of everyday life, the whole lesson of these criticism is in the light they throw upon the evil consequences of neglecting this duty. Theological speculation, in the sense of conscious reference to supernatural truth to everyday life, is a duty incumbent upon us, and we can escape the necessity of thinking things out for ourselves on the plea of divine revelation. It is the claim of the Thomist that St. Thomas can help us both in the task of philosophical inquiry, arguing from what is given in experience, and in this labor of theological deduction, arguing from what is given to re in revelation to solve our problem. Here we shall be mainly concerned with what his philosophy has to offer, 
though we shall have frequent occasion to the turn of his to his theology and must deal with it at the conclusion of our survey, since only there we can find the ultimate and complete view of life. That philosophy is in no way dependent upon the experimental sciences. It is not affected by discoveries in physics. Its principles are beyond any scientific formula, and they are therefore in no way tied to any particular age or to the acceptance of a particular scientific theory. It is misleading, therefore, to talk of going back to St. Thomas. If one were to advocate some physical theory held by him, which had long since been discredited, one would be going back. But the theory the Thomist advocates is a uh, metaphysical theory. And what we try to do when we accept it is to go forward, discovering for an outlook an attitude to reality, which is itself timeless, ever new applications and new enrichments. Application to the problems of modern life, enrichments from the finding of modern thought and experiment and research, and the point is to be emphasized that not only is Thomism capable of application to modern needs and patient of enrichment by modern experience, but of its very nature it demands those things. The Thomist cannot by content to browse over Thomism as St. Thomas left it. Study of St. Thomas does not merely mean knowing what St. Thomas said about this and that. It does not mean being able to talk scholastic jargon. It means acquiring a certain outlook, assimilating and making one's own a certain set of principles, and so coming to possess a habit of, or capacity for, judging about things, things of every sort and description, not the theological things merely, or obtruse speculative points, but the things that occur every day and all day. It means having a point of view about literature and art, about films and film stars, about wages and wage earners, about aeroplanes and H-bombs and war and worship, and, in general, the world. We all, of course, make judgments about these things. Sometimes our judgments are based purely on prejudice, perhaps on other people's prejudices. But even if they are not, even if they are based on purely rational grounds, we shall not be complete until all our judgments are reducible to a single judgment, a single point of view. In other words, until we have achieved order and synthesis, a theory in our thought. Thomism does, at any rate, provide a central doctrine, a principle which, outside temporal mutations itself, affords a worldview and an outlook which the experiences of today can be coherently judged, ordered, and synthesized. That is the great extrinsic argument for considering its intrinsic claims to truth. It remains to outline that principle in its more immediate applications. Chapter 2. The Thomist Principle It was the opinion of Lord Acton that, not the devil, but St. Thomas Aquinas was the first Whig. What frees this alarming statement from the charge of sheer falsehood? is the fact that St. Thomas was realistic enough to want to put a check upon the power of the sovereign, being no lover of Leviathans. His political realism was paralleled in other departments of his philosophy. Immanuel Kant had much to say about the dogmatists who preceded him, the high-flown people who wove metaphysical webs out of principles which they never attempted to prove and could not in any case, as he thought, hope to prove. Since the critique, it has been accepted task of philosophers to prove man's ability to know anything, and the fact that there is anything other than himself to know, 
before proceeding any further in the business of synthesizing and explaining the data of experience. Modern followers of St. Thomas have shown that the problem of knowledge can in fact be dealt with from his own writings, though he himself had no reason to lay especial stress upon it. But in this century of war and disorder and distress, of chaos so widespread and so extreme, it may well seem too remotely academic to be asked to argue about the reality of these things, to try and prove the existence of bodies when they are being riddled with bullets or pulverized and disintegrated by bombs. Philosophy, we feel, must be able to throw some light upon the state of affairs, afford us some idea of the direction to be pursued, offer us principles upon which to found a re-establishment of order, if it is to be worth while. A theory is not necessarily true because it works, so at least the Thomist holds, together with the upholders of the absolute, but it is more than likely to be false if it neither helps to explain the common experience of mankind, nor offers a workable scheme for the successful ordering of men's lives. St. Thomas was a realist in the sense of being fully alive to the facts and problems of existence, and since any sketch of his philosophy to be made within the compass of a few pages must necessarily omit much, and should presumably aim at delineating some particular aspect of his thought, it will be enough here to try to suggest the perfection of synthesis which unifies the whole of his thought and the consequent possibility of finding in it a principle of order and redemption for the world of today. All men naturally desire to know, said Aristotle. In Tristram Shandy, the same great truth is differently expressed. When great or unexpected events fall, fall out upon the stage of this sublunary world, the unexpected event in this case being the falling of the hot chestnut into F Futatorius's breeches, the mind of man, which is an inquisitive kind of substance, naturally takes a flight behind the scenes to see what is the cause and first spring of them. In Greece, investigation as to the cause and spring of things in general concerned itself first with what was later called the material cause, the stuff out of which the manifold thing was formed. Thales thought his, this first principle to be water, an opinion, says the venerable Antoni, Antonius Godin, which would seem to have come from the Egyptians who were indebted for the fertility of their land to the inundations of the Nile. Anaximenes, on the contrary, was in favor of air, Heraclitus the obscure, of fire, the divine spirit which knows and directs all things. But one of the characteristics of fire is its restlessness, its unceasing movement, and Heraclitus is in consequence the father of all the philosophies of the devenir pur, the philosophies of becoming. In the juxtaposition of this theory, that all is becoming with the contrary Parmedian position that only being is, non-being is not, and there is no becoming, is the formula of the first degree, first great antinomy. Either, it seems, one must say with Parmenides that all movement, and therefore the whole phenomenal universe, is illusion, or on the other hand, one must cling to the reality of movement and jettison the reality of being, static, absolute, intelligible, it is on the principle which enabled Aristotle to offer a solution to this antinomy that the fabric of Thomism is built up. In every entity other than God, Aristotle held, there is comp composition of two elements, the actual and the potential. 
the meaning of the terms is most readily grasped by example. The kitten is not possessed of the full perfection of felinity, but it will normal, normally achieve this perfection. It will become a full-grown cat because there is in it the capability of so doing, the capability of becoming a cat and not a cobra. It is potentially a cat. Again, Shakespeare in the womb, to use Father Darcy's example, had not actually the intelligence to write Hamlet, but he would never have written it had, had he been initially without any capacity to do so. He was potentially a poet. This same distinction is expressed in other terms in the analysis of the makeup of material things. Aristotle there speaks of the const constitutive elements as bare matter and substantial form. And again, the meaning of the terms is best seen in examples. A log of wood put upon the fire passes through a variety of changes and becomes ashes. There has been, when the process is complete, a passage from one term to another, from one sort or kind of being to another, and this implies that beneath the process, as a subject of the changes involved, there would be a reality capable of being now wood and now ashes. As, to use another example, we might say of a block of marble that it was capable of becoming either a statue of David or a table in a tea shop. There is, in other words, an element in things which is of itself indeterminate, but capable of a variety of determinations. It is this indeterminate and determinable element which is called matter, the determinate which is called form. Aristotle further remarks that the determinable without the determinant would be in a state of privation, and, metamorph metamorphically, of desire. And so movement is explained in terms of a passage from privation to possession, to the fulfillment of desire in the actual reception of a determination. The marble block actually becomes the statue of David. The acorn actually becomes an oak. The distinction between matter and form is thus one application of the wider distinction between potentiality and actuality. Matter is regarded as potential with regard to form. And while this latter term had been taken by Aristotle in the narrow material sense of shape, as the form of a statue is the, is the shape of the statue, he now enlarges the idea so that the primary sense of the word comes to that of a specific determinant. The element which makes a thing of this kind of, of rather than that, an oak tree and not a caterpillar. This was called by St. Thomas substantial form, and it is in this sense that the word will be used here. Now from the analysis of actual and potential, Aristotle had argued to the existence of an actus purus, a being whose essence is actuality, and in whom is life most good and eternal. But in his discussion of the relation between actus purus and the universe, he is ultimately reduced to speaking in terms of final causality, expressed in the metaphor of ap appetition, the universal desire of the potential for actuality. His God remains a remote and silent spectator. God, enlarging the Aristotelian conception of potential and actual, was able to offer a more adequate solution, which efficient causality also was included. There is, in all material things, he holds, besides a composition of matter and form, a further existential composition. The deepest expression of the distinction between actual and potential is found in terms of being. The thing, the composition, which is matter and form are constituents, is itself potential with regard to being whereby it is. 
The quad est, in St. Thomas's terms, is an other than the quo est. It is the quo est, being, which actualizes that which without it remains purely potential in the order of real experiences. The compositum is, with regard to it, receptive, potential. The element which limits the entity to this or that grade of being, it is esse, being, which exist, existentially actualizes it, which places it in the realm of really existing entities. There is, therefore, in the existing thing the potentiality to be or not to be, and the actuality of being. And these are really distinct since the determinable is really distinct from the determinant. The whole entity, regarded as a what, is potential in respect to being as such. This conclusion radically alters the Aristotelian conception of God. St. Thomas makes use of the famous argument from movement and Kant's attack upon the cosmological proof has not invalidated the claims of this argument to prove what St. Thomas meant it to prove, the existence of a pure actuality. The connotations of the term being elsewhere elucidated. Whatever moves, he argues, is moved by something other than itself, for movement is the passage from potentiality to actuality, therefore that which is set in motion must be potential. But that which moves, transitively, must be actual, for a thing cannot act unless it first is. Therefore, then, a thing cannot be at one and the same time in the same respect actual and potential, being and non-being, it follows that the potential must be moved to its actuality by that which is already actual. Now this series cannot be prolonged ad infinitum. There must eventually be found that which is not dependent, but on which the others depend. And this is the first unmoved mover we term God. Aristotle's pure actuality. But whereas Aristotle was forced to postulate the coexistence of an eternal potential, explaining the cosmic process in terms of the appetition of the potential for the actual, the St. Thomas, on the other hand, is now able to show the total dependence of the universe on the pure actuality, since everything for him is potential in regards to existence. And so to argue to the necessity of creation ex nihilo. And for him, appetition becomes something more than a vague metaphor. Pure actuality can have no end or purpose outside of itself, for this would imply the presence of potentiality. It is the movens immobile, the unmoved mover, but everything other than pure actuality is finite, potential, moving towards an actualization which is outside itself, and which ultimately is seen to consist in participation in the goodness of God. For movement, actuality, is only to be explained in terms of a sought end. That end is, for the agent, a good congruous to it, for otherwise it would not seek it. And ultimately, since the series of final causes cannot be indefinitely prolonged, all particular ends resolve themselves into the one end which can be an end to them all, the one good which is the cause of all goodness, which is God. Now the goodness of God is infinite, simple. It cannot be then shared as such by the finite. But it can be shared in partial reflections in multiplicity, and so it is that the beauty of God is reflected in the variety of the manifold, the perfection of God in the perfections proper to the different grades of beings. 
Every entity other than God, then, tends to this sharing of the perfection of the summon bonum. The relative, by reason of its relativity, has a tendency towards the absolute, and the potentialities of the entity are actualized in so far as the process comes to completion. The absolute remains transcendent. The finite can never compass the finite, and the end remains outside it. But the assimilare deo, which is the end of creatures, the compassing of the likeness of God, is achieved by way of anagalous imitation. It is in so far as things have a being that they are likened to God, who is being itself, whereas all other things are, as it were, but partakers of being. What precisely is the imitation of God's perfection in the case of man? Of the ultimate end to which divine revelation points, the holy supernatural sharing in the intimate life of God in the beatific vision, we shall have to speak later. For the philosopher, the answer must lie in the examination of the potentialities which are to be found in the human person. A thing becomes like God's perfection in respect of everything which pertains to its proper goodness, and the goodness of a thing resides not only in its substantial being, but in all the elements necessary to its full perfection. The accidentals which belong to its completion and the activity proper to it, for this last also belongs to the perfection of the thing. The perfection or completion of itself is thus for Thomas at the end of everything. In that lies its happiness, and towards that, therefore, it is of its nature oriented. Not to reach that end is evil, for evil means privation of being but not to be made for that end, to be orientated, so to say, in the opposite direction, is unthinkable. For a miss he were made, who was made not for joy. This doctrine of the desire and striving of all things for actuality is the philosophical expression of the first chapter of Genesis, of the Spirit of God brooding over the waters and causing the manifold forms to emerge from the dark chaos. It is also, of course, in line with evolution, if a caveat was made accepting the Spirit from the process and safeguarding the existence of real kinds. We of today have much to learn from St. Thomas's Metaphysic of Man. The idea of all the potentialities being brought to their completion, not separately and in rivalry, but harmoniously, making for synthesis, the ultimate actuality of a completed personality, completed in unity, for unity is the end since it is being. This idea is, in practice at least, too often ignored. It follows immediately from the basic principle of the Thomist theory that the ultimate real components of man are on the one hand bare matter, on the other the soul. There is, as they put it in the Middle Ages, only one substantial form in man. Soul and body, therefore, are not two separate things. Still less is it true on this theory that the body is the prison of the soul, and must be destroyed if the soul is to be liberated. There is one undivided entity, at once spiritual and physical, and its proper completion therefore comprises the completion of both these elements. For the philosopher, faced with the fact of death, there is here an insuperable difficulty. For the theologian, the difficulty is solved by the doctrine of the resurrection of the body. For in the final completion of paradise, the full and perfect possession of unending life, wherein St. Thomas's phrase, all desires are fulfilled, the physical or corporal potentialities reach their perfection in the company with those of the soul. 
Today we are concerned again, not always from the wisest angle, with the rights of the body, but we do not always realize that we have lost. We, it is not primarily a question of physical fitness. In Lawrence's words, we have lost almost entirely the great and intrinsically developed sensual awareness or sense awareness and sense knowledge of the ancients. Our conscience rays is wide but shallow as a sheet of paper. We have thought wisdom to consist in much cerebration, and we have de despised intuition, the direct contact, or else have turned the senses into a plaything. To this latter evil, the economic system has led us with the exor exorbitant demands on time and attention during the day, so that when work is over and there is at last time to look about one at the world and see that it is good, exhaustion makes impossible anything more taxing than passive amusement. To the deliberate and complete despising of sense awareness, some writers exhort us on the plea that they are the channels whereby evil enters into the soul, which, unhappy, unhappily, is true enough. The logical conclusion of their argument being that one should blind and deafen oneself and live in a cage to prevent all contact, it is thus that Wilde's Herod speaks, but I will look at you no more, neither at things nor at people should one look, only in mirrors should one look, for mirrors do but show us masks. It is a very different thing from the practical advice given by all ascetic writers. Shut your senses from the world, they tell us, and if you would discover and unite yourself with the higher things. Obviously, such a program is often a necessity, as is a commonplace of all mysticism. The mind of man is apt in fact, to become absorbed in the manifold to the exclusion of the one. His heart to become entangled in self-seeking in the beauties of the fleeting and blind to the beauty that does not fade. Where there is less direct opposition, there is still the danger of overactivity and the necessity for per periods of great retirement lest vision grows dim. Complete seclusion may be only possible means of catharsis as of discovery. While normally for these moments devoted to the deliberate turning of the soul to God and search for the union with him, the setting aside of the sensible and the mundane is an indispensable preliminary. But we have to beware of enlarging these practical expedients to the dimensions of a universal and metaphysical theory of life. The invisible things of God find entry to the soul through the visible. Hearing, seeing, feeling can hardly be evil in themselves, since they are part of the very organization of man's being, and it would be an ungracious act, to say the least for the creature to disown as evil, or as inevitably produ productive of evil, those attributes of which the Creator has endowed him. We might pronounce a suspension of all living to be our ideal as being the nearest approach not to committing any offense. Yet such an idea is too grotesque to be tenable though perhaps some such notion has visited the religious minds of the East, but we are saved from such a human extravagance by the figure of Christ, the eternal Christ life, in our midst. God himself provides these resources of beauty on which we refuse to look. We must not impute evil to the innocent thing or creature of his act, it is not all the beauty we can manage to see, but in addition to the store through which we become aware of him. We cannot serve two masters, and if we establish a gloomy puritanical order of our own making, 
we must perforce to give up the order of God. St. Thomas urges the student to despise no avenue of knowledge. In Tristam Shandy, the same maxim is inculcated. What hindrance, hurt, or harm doth the laudable desire of knowledge bring to any man, even if from a sot, a pot, a fool, a stool, a winter mitten, a truck, truckle for a pulley, the lid of a goldsmith's crucible, an oil bottle, an old slipper, or a cane chair. Another danger to be guarded against is the lack of appreciation of the absolute value of the contemplation. Instead of that speculative philosophy which is taught in the schools, wrote Descartes, and we pause to admit that its spirit had little com common with that of St. Thomas, we may find a practical philosophy by means of which we can render ourselves the masters and possessors of nature. That philosophical outlook, combined with political jingoism and economic greed, has produced today an attitude to thought, has given, rather, a meaning to thought, in which the contemplation for its own sake plays no part, and which was admirably summed up by a writer quoted in Mencken's Americana. From the material and every other point of view, there is no better investment than thinking. So we have a man who is a success at selling stockings or vacuum cleaners, but who on any question of ultimates is mindless. St. Thomas's attitude is very different. Contemplation, vision of the truth, is for him an end in itself, is indeed the end. Action should follow upon it and be directed by it, for, as Bacon pointed out, the general counsels and the plots and marshalling of affairs come best from those that are learned. But this means that the complete life is made up of contemplation and of action issuing from it, not that contemplation is of value, only as an issuing in action.